Welcome again, everybody, to Cambridge Health Alliance Lunch and Learn. Today we have Dr. Stephen Piles, who is a Chief of Geriatric Psychiatry with us, and we are going to talk about a very important uh, and burning issue, which is memory. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Piles. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, Roberta. It is a pleasure to be here. And I have to start by saying, I have known Roberta for probably 20, I don't know, 22 plus years here at CHA, and it has been a delight working with you. And I know that you requested this subject, so maybe you have some personal interest in the topic, uh, or maybe you thought it might be a timely kind of thing for us to review today. So I'm going to uh, give you uh, an overview of cognitive changes that happen with normal healthy aging and also uh, talk about uh, some of the warning signs for early dementia and treatment that uh, is now available for dementia and conclude with some healthy lifestyle choices that people can make in their life. So many of you have seen this picture before. This is Jean Calmont, who's from France. Uh, she lived to be 122 and a half years old, the oldest living person in recorded history and just an extraordinary life. And I would recommend Googling her to, to learn about her life. Uh, but like many of these super centenarians, they had uh, very, um, uh, their, their lifestyle choices were important for us to learn from. Uh, and I, I don't wanna spend our time going through her life because it, we have many other things to review. Uh, but just know there's a lot of interest in uh, who's going to live the longest. And of course, the. The most exciting news is this woman who is now in the running. Uh, her name is Lucille Rendon. She is 118 years old. She'll be 119 in February. And she has stated very clearly, I wanna be the oldest living person on the planet. She's got another few years to go. Uh, but there's a picture of her as a small girl. And of course, she's a very uh, faithful person. And there, is, there are correlations between faith and longevity. Uh, certainly a uh, strong faith helps us with healing and with uh, resilience. Uh, and so we, we see that theme in many older adults. But I also wanna highlight uh, this young lady here who uh, back in the year 2015, uh, I'm sorry, 2005 was the oldest living human. She lived to be 115 years uh, of age. And what's interesting about uh, Enrique van Andelschipper from the Netherlands is that she had a whole workup uh, an evaluation at the age of 112. And with neuropsych testing and uh, laboratory testing and brain imaging studies, there was no evidence for Alzheimer's disease or any uh, cognitive disorder. And just to make the point, just because we get older does not necessarily mean we're gonna get Alzheimer's disease or one of these other dreaded dementias. In fact, uh, most people don't. If, if you survive past your 90s into your 100s, uh, you've passed the point where usually we see the onset of Alzheimer's disease and other diseases of, of uh, cognitive decline. So let's do a little review. There are many, many factors that contribute to cognitive loss. And we haven't time to review all of them, but the, the big ones are medical. And as we get older, we're obviously at higher risk for medical conditions that compromise our thinking, our memory. There are many psychosocial uh, issues in terms of the supports you have, uh, many environmental factors uh, regarding where you live, whether you're a rural-based person or in the city, uh, the kind of uh, housing uh, you happen to enjoy, your physical condition, and your motivation. We'll be talking a little bit about depression, anxiety, and other factors that can contribute to cognitive loss. Naturally, there are many different challenges of aging, which we're all familiar with, uh, beginning often with retirement or a sudden loss of income. And that change of identity that comes when you lose that job or give up that job, or you change your role at home uh, with the loss of family members, friends, or a loved one, uh, often we are depending on others for support. Physical disability, a natural consequence of aging, uh, also contributes to social isolation. We talk in, in a moment about loneliness, which is a big factor with aging. And the sensory losses. Uh, 
you know, as we lose our visual acuity, uh, hearing, especially in men, I'm, I'm suffering from that already. Oftentimes we can improve cognitive uh, function just by adding hearing aids or improving visual uh, supports or um, you know, making sure that people have the right uh, kinds of um, supports in their home so that they're able to uh, navigate safely. Uh, and it, oftentimes um, you'll see older adults with hearing impairment who are not hearing uh, and able to participate in uh, conversations. They're detached and disconnected from people. And it really is a, an obstacle that's difficult to overcome. So sensory loss is often overlooked, especially when older adults come to the hospital where they're really challenged by a new environment and, and people are coming at them all day. There's been a huge amount of research on the subject of loneliness over the last uh, 20 years. And in fact, now there are really good studies that show loneliness contributes to all of these different medical conditions. Uh, it increases the immunologic response. It, it, it actually heightens our uh, likelihood for high blood pressure, um, heart attack, stroke. It worsens our diabetes control. Uh, it's been correlated with uh, hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol and inflammation. And in fact, loneliness has been correlated with dementia. This study just done a couple years ago uh, showed that loneliness was associated with a 40% increased risk of dementia over a 10 year time, uh, controlling for gender, race, ethnicity, education. It's just extraordinary. Um, and loneliness is different from isolation. When we think about loneliness, that's the, that's the uh, subjective experience of being alone and uh, the difficulty managing uh, without supports and without contact with other. Social isolation is something more objective that some older adults choose. Some prefer to be isolated. Others, uh, for, uh, for reasons outside of their control, are forced into isolation, which contributes, of course, to loneliness. And anxiety and depression, which are huge subjects. Each uh, requires an hour-long talk on their own. But I'll just make some uh, summary comments. Anxiety is one of the most common conditions of aging that we see in psychiatry. And uh, I, the pictures just help highlight some of the emotions that go along with these conditions, because uh, sometimes it's worth a thousand words. I could fill the screen with data, but who needs that? You get the picture. Um, anxiety is devastating, and it actually keeps people from going outside, interacting with others, uh, taking care of their health. Uh, and anxiety can be paralyzing and lead to cognitive decline. It also uh, impacts attention and concentration. So people who are highly anxious can't pay attention to normal things. And in fact, their memory is unimpaired. They, they never take in the information to store it in the first place because the anxiety is so profound. So we see older adults with panic attacks, uh, particularly related to a new medical diagnosis or condition, breathing disorders, heart disease. So anxiety and depression both go along with medical conditions that are part of aging. And with depression, we particularly worry about late onset. So that's different from people who have had depression their whole life. When we see an older adult who has depression for the first time later in life, it's often the result of something else. Uh, and it could be dementia or other conditions. We'll come back to that in a minute. So with normal, healthy aging, we see changes that occur naturally. And number one is that loss of recent episodic memory. By episodic, I mean it has a time and a place. So what did you have for breakfast this morning? Well, you've got to put yourself back at that kitchen table and remember, was it cereal or was it, what did, what did I? And it, it's, it, that, there's a loss in that uh, short-term memory function. Uh, that's normal uh, and it's frustrating. That's the going into the next room to get something and you forgot what it was and you have to go back to the room where you started to remember what the thought was in order to recall what it was you went into the other room for. It's that loss of recent memory. It's really frustrating. But in addition to that, we see with aging a decline in the speed of processing and problem solving skills. And, and I see this in the checkout line. You know, you're at the store, you're checking out. 
and you've got to get the money out. You've got to deal with the credit card. And what, what was that number I have to punch in to get the discount? And then, and then your phone rings and you get distracted by that. It's so that flexibility is not there. You can't shift from this to that as easily with normal aging. And so you become overwhelmed by all of the, the fast pace, all the information coming in and shifting from stimulus to stimulus. We also see changes in naming. What was the name of that movie star? What, what, is the, what is that word I'm trying to think of? Ah, drives you crazy, but it's just part of aging. If you wait, you've got a little time, it'll come to you. There's a delay in that naming. It takes a little longer to pull up those names. And verbal fluency also suffers. The only thing that gets better with age uh, is, is in fact vocabulary. Uh, which tends to increase, improve, you know, the more we read, the more we interact. Vocabulary improves up until uh, mid 70s and that starts to decline as well. And with uh, aging, we see loss of brain volume. So again, normal, healthy aging, no dementia, we'll see 10 to 50% weight loss of the brain alone and a widening of those folds and a loss of neurotransmitter function. And, Here's a brain just to make that point clear. On the left is a normal, healthy brain. On the right is a brain uh, from someone with Alzheimer's disease. And you see those, those wide spaces in between the folds. That's not good. That in fact suggests there is some serious problem going on here. Atrophy or shrinkage of the brain, part of aging, but an accelerated kind of process with Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. So I want to introduce the, com the concept of mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, you may have heard of. And this describes an early stage memory loss for those who are otherwise able to manage their own care or live independently and, and take care of business. So it may be some mild memory loss, but nothing else. You can still pay the bills, you can get to the store, you can make your best meal and dress in the morning, and you can manage day to day but there is some memory loss or some other cognitive loss which is suggestive of a problem. And that's something we need to, this is the, the red flag or the canary uh, that we, we look for. With folks over the age of 60, if we get a large group and we study them, between 12 and 18% 18 of them will have MCI or mild cognitive impairment. If we follow those people over time, between 10 and 15% of them will actually go on to develop dementia each year. So there on the bottom, about one third of people with MCI due to Alzheimer's disease develop Alzheimer's dementia within five years. So MCI is like a, um, it's a transitional stage between normal cognition and Alzheimer's. We see this uh, progress occurring or progression occurring with MCI. Some of the warning signs. When people come to see me and they can't remember their personal history or medical history, they don't remember recent events or conversations, they lose things. They ask the same questions over and over. Well, I do that already, right? We see a change in driving skills or managing the bills, paying, the, uh, you know, managing the checkbook, missing appointments, showing up on the wrong day. These are just the, the early signs. How do we manage MCI? Well, oftentimes medications are the culprit. A lot of the medicines we prescribe cause or worsen confusion. Drugs and alcohol may contribute. People who have supravascular disease or heart disease or diabetes, in other words, they have problems with their vascular flow to the brain, may in fact be, be at a higher risk for MCI and dementia. So we've got to manage that. We've got to keep the blood pressure under control and the blood sugars stable, et cetera. Optimized sensory function, we've talked about that. Education, education, that's what we're doing today. Thank you, Roberta. And treating anxiety and mood disorders. Often depression looks like dementia. We'll talk about that in a moment. And of course, regular monitoring to make sure it's not progressing. Some people with MCI will just maintain that slightly lower level of function, but they get by and, and it doesn't progress into Alzheimer's or other types of disease. So it requires monitoring. So this is a hard to see slide. So I'll walk you through it. This is trying to highlight the um, concept I'm describing with a graph. And off to the far right, we see dementia. You see this dotted line. And that time frame could be uh, 20, 30 years or more. Oftentimes, people are not diagnosed with dementia until there's a significant change in their cognition. 
and the average time from diagnosis to death is about 10 years. That dark part of the slide of that um, graph, it says MCI. Again, that's the transition stage. And then the earliest stage is called preclinical. That is people who have just some very slight cognitive changes, but it doesn't come to anyone's attention. So those are the early years. And we now know that Alzheimer's doesn't just start 10 years before you die, it starts decades before it's identified. And there are all these biomarkers that we can look for, changes in the brain, changes in the chemistry. Uh, there are blood tests that may help us identify Alzheimer's and now brain imaging studies. So they're called biomarkers to help us identify when that disease starts so we can introduce treatment interventions to, to maybe change the course a little bit. As things progress, we see more frank memory loss and disorient disorientation is a big one. If somebody comes in, they don't know the day, the place, what's going on around them. These are, these are big signs of dementia. Often uh, people will come to me with changes in personality and behavior. Um, it's not uncommon for loved ones to bring um, their, their, um, the person they're taking care of and say, I think they're depressed. There's something that's wrong. They're not the same. They don't speak or participate in conversations. They're not taking care of themselves. They're not doing the things they used to do. It must be depression. And in fact, when we do the workup, it's not depression. It's this early dementia or progressive dementia. Loss of executive function. That's a big one. We see changes in organizing, planning, sequencing. The process of uh, making a meal, it's highly complex. So which ingredients go next? Um, it, it, the, the process of dressing even, uh, knowing what comes first. And when you get into the higher level executive function, planning uh, a trip or, or managing uh, some financial uh, change, these are uh, complex processes that can fall apart with early dementia. So when folks come to the doc, this is what happens. You get a history, we interview the patient, the family, caregivers, we do cognitive screening, we check their capacity. Are you able to do these things for yourself or do you need help? Of course, a neurological exam, blood tests, brain imaging. But the part of this that gives me the, the most information uh, often is, is interviewing the family and getting uh, an idea of what's changed for their loved one over recent years. Because the tests just don't highlight what, what those changes are that, that brings them to our attention now. And of course, brain imaging studies uh, have been a game changer. This is a PET scan and it looks at function. And the brain on the left is a normal brain. The brain on the right, it's looking at changes in use of glucose or sugar. And you see on both sides of the brain, that's a signature scan for, for Alzheimer's disease. And that scan is now covered by Medicare because it costs like a thousand bucks. You don't want to get this done unless you really need to. But this is a, a fairly clear test that helps us with the diagnosis. About 10 to 15% of all dementias are reversible. And so the first order of business is to look for reversible causes of cognitive change. Like I mentioned, depression's one, drug and alcohol use, thyroid disease, B12 deficiency, among other things, that's a big one. B12 is a, a essential vitamin that we don't make. We have to take it in from the outside. It's gotta come from meat or leafy green vegetables or vitamin supplements. And folks that have trouble absorbing B12 may have a deficiency. In fact, their stomach doesn't allow absorption of this crucial vitamin that will ultimately lead to cognitive loss. It looks like dementia. So in fact, they have to have it replaced either by a pill or by a shot once a month if they can't absorb it. Tumor, bleeds, swelling, infections, delirium, these are all, uh, in some cases, reversible causes of dementia that we're, we're always looking for to turn things around. And depression, I've mentioned many times. When folks become depressed and they shut down and they stop eating and they stop sleeping and participating in life and they really begin to appear confused and have memory loss, we call that pseudo-dementia. It's not real dementia, it's the dementia that's secondary to or due to depression. It, it looks different, it tests differently. You can detect this uh, often with the right kind of testing in the office, 
in, a, in most cases, it's reversible. But for up almost in this study, uh, almost 40% of older adults with this pseudodementia or dementia syndrome, if we follow them out over a couple or few years, we see, in fact, that was the onset of dementia. So just to make this point again, oftentimes the first symptom of dementia will be depression. And that's, a, that's a, a, often a warning sign in why older adults will often come to the psychiatrist. And so it's up to us to really do not just treatment for depression, but also cognitive testing to make sure there's not something else going on underneath that depression. Um, as you might, uh, you won't be surprised to know when we treat the depression, it often doesn't respond in quite the same way as younger people who have depression. Uh, but still we try and, and the antidepressants and therapy sometimes have some benefit. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of irreversible dementia. And this graph just highlights the top four causes. Alzheimer's is on the left, accounting for almost two thirds of all dementia. Vascular is VAD, that's a, maybe the second or possibly third most common cause. DLB means Lewy body disease and FTD is frontal temporal. And uh, the other category, there are over 90 different causes of dementia. So dementia is the general term. It's sort of the, the it describes the memory loss, the changes in uh, speech and language and function. Um, that's sort of a general description of a cognitive disorder. But Alzheimer's disease is the one we most commonly see uh, it is, uh, again, one of the most devastating diseases of our time, and one that there's been a, just an extraordinary amount of research over recent decades, which we'll, we'll talk about briefly. Over 6 million people are diagnosed in the U.S. That, that's going to more than double in the next 30 years. More than two-thirds, almost two-thirds, are women. Um, African Americans and Hispanic Latinos are disproportionately at higher risk. Uh, that may have to do with access to care, may have to do with um, the uh, likelihood of um, coronary artery disease, heart disease, stroke. All of these factors contribute to Alzheimer's disease. If you have small strokes in your brain, you're at a greater risk. If you're a boxer and you get hit in the head too many times, you're at greater risk. Motorcycles, forget it. Don't use them. All right, medications. The most common cause of delirium or confusion in older adults is medications. And we see this very commonly. People come to the hospital, they're on 15 or 20 different medications. And what happens is they see all these specialists and people keep adding medicines more and more and more. And so the most common problem are these anticholinergic side effects. By anticholinergic, I mean dry mouth, constipation, dry eyes. It, it, it dries your whole body out it causes confusion. And when we take those medications away, the confusion often will lift. And so it's, it's very gratifying to see just the uh, tapering off medications to help improve cognition. Uh, we try to avoid sedatives or sleepy medicines. Steroids have cognitive side effects. Of course, narcotics and opiates, stimulants, alcohol, caffeine, all of the medicines we prescribe in psychiatry uh, could potentially contribute to or worsen confusion. and sleep. So with, with any type of dementia, there's a disruption of sleep. So we see people who have mild and moderate stages of Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia, their body clock is just all mixed up. And so they're awake all night and they might sleep during the day. And this can be just devastating to caregivers who are chasing their loved one around the house and trying to get them back to bed, but they're not tired. Their, their, their body clock is completely, it's their, their schedule has just changed and they're not able to settle down at night, they get more anxious. And that's where we see wandering behavior. So I wanna spend a minute talking about behavioral disturbances, um, which are very common. Over 90, up to 95% of people with Alzheimer's disease will have behavioral disturbances, including things like anxiety, depression, agitation, wandering, restlessness, it could be mood instability, uh, aggression, violence, but the most common behavioral disturbance is apathy. People that are just sitting in the chair doing nothing, not talking, not engaging. And it's really frustrating for caregivers who are trying to take care of their loved one. 
in the distress, the burden is just immense. Uh, so naturally, the caregivers uh, get burned out. Uh, and this leads to earlier institutionalization. Uh, and of course, a, a decline in the quality of life. Caregivers, it's a full-time job. Sometimes it's like having two jobs, 40 to 100 hours per week, loss of income, lots of frustration, depression and anxiety are very common with caregivers. And half of them say they don't have time for themselves or take care of the other family members. Uh, most caregivers are women, uh, less, about half are daughters. Uh, often it's the spouse that's doing the primary caregiving, uh, but the, the burnout is huge. And so when we meet uh, folks with Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia, we, we really try to do an assessment of and support the caregivers to make sure they're getting the care and support they need. So what leads to the breaking point? That is when you can no longer do it. Oftentimes it's that misidentification or the lost identity. When, when your loved one says, who are you? And what are you doing in my house? And what are you trying? Suddenly there's this change in or loss of identity. And it's really disarming to know that your spouse no longer recognizes you or your parent no longer recognizes you. And it becomes a conflictual kind of encounter every day. But the two behaviors that really are the, the game changers are incontinence in that nighttime behavior or nocturnal deterioration. When people are up wandering night after night and the caregivers can't get sleep, they get burned out quicker. And incontinence and changing the linens and the, the dress and the, the, the bedding and the uh, clothing, it's just, it's discouraging. And so these are the two behaviors that often lead to nursing home placement or long-term care referral. Uh, it takes a village for a reason. It takes multiple caregivers to deliver care at home. <laughs> When we're tr treating older adults, uh, in fact, anyone, we want to uh, obviously improve cognitive symptoms and function, but reduce caregiver burden, hopefully slow the rate of decline, delay the onset if that's uh, possible, or prevention. We'll talk about that in a moment. There are a whole bunch of meds now available. Um, you've certainly all heard of Aricept. Uh, Aricept can help improve cognition a little bit. It's a small... Uh, change in some, not all, uh, but more importantly, it's been shown to help delay the time to nursing home placement by six to nine months. And for that reason alone, we use it uh, not just to help cognition, it may help improve behavior and again, delay the time to uh, referral for long-term care. Namenda or memetine is used for severe dementia, again, with very limited benefit. And the big news is this Edukenumab, this monoclonal antibody that came out just a couple of years ago, um, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it requires infusions. Uh, about a third of people receiving this drug will have brain swelling. So it requires MRI studies of the brain every few months. Uh, it can cause small bleeds in the brain. And it absolutely clears that plaque. The amyloid plaque will be uh, taken away, but it hasn't been shown to improve cognition in any kind of significant a way to justify its cost, which is you know fifty-five thousand dollars a year and up. This this drug will break the Medicare bank, so uh, I don't think it's one that we'll see for much longer. But uh, a successor is now in testing. It just uh, there was a report on the news recently. The Kenamab is also a monoclonal antibody and has been shown to improve cognition a little bit. Uh, we'll see. I, I I fully expect this one will be approved uh, in the next year or two. Uh, same, it, it also has the risk for brain swelling and bleeds. So this is not a clean drug, it's a dirty drug, uh, but it's a start. And it hopefully will give us some hope that down the road, there'll be some better treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And I always get asked about natural supplements and alternative treatments. And there's a whole long list, this is a short list. And I'm just gonna say a couple things about a, a couple of these um, options. You've heard of Ginkgo. Ginkgo has been around for thousands of years. The Chinese have been using this for a long, long time. And we now know it's, a, it's an antioxidant. It protects neurons. It can increase memory a little bit. It actually works by the same mechanism as Aricept and other drugs like that. So you have to take a lot of it. It's a, it's a, a supplement you'd have to take 120 milligrams twice a day or more. Uh, but for those who are dedicated to that task may see some improvement in cognition. The other one I wanna highlight is curcumin or turmeric which uh, we know in India, uh, people that eat large amounts of curry 
have a slightly lower risk for Alzheimer's disease. And it's probably because of turmeric, uh, which is the, that's the, the bright orange yellow color that we see with mustard and curry powder. Uh, also an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. It may help diminish plaques. It's an interesting uh, spice, but again, one you'd have to take a lot of. I, I couldn't handle all that curry. I'd have a stomachache every day. So a lot of it's what we choose, right? What we, what we might pick. It seems like an easy choice, but quite frankly, uh, as people tell me, if they were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I'm going for the cheeseburger. Forget about all that roughage. I don't need all that rabbit food. Uh, but if you eat healthy, you can lower your risk for Alzheimer's and other diseases. And here's one study among many showing that older adults with um, high levels of vitamin B, C, D, and E, and omega-3 fatty acids that we find in fish were uh, likely to have less cognitive uh, impairment less memory loss and less brain atrophy or shrinkage. So we have to avoid uh, trans fats uh, and we have to avoid high cholesterol foods. And there, you know, you are what you eat. It makes a lot of sense. This Mediterranean diet we've been hearing about, low in fats, uh, trying to reduce our dairy intake and meat intake, rather um, uh, using red wine in moderation uh, and, and focusing on vegetables and fruits. Uh, one variant uh, is this DASH diet we've heard about. It's been shown to help reduce blood pressure problems or hypertension. Again, high in fruit and vegetables, but also using more whole grains in, in lean proteins and low fat dairy supplements and nuts has been shown to reduce blood pressure, cholesterol, and I, I'm sure uh, will help improve our longevity. So what are you gonna pick? Seems like an easy choice, right? All right, prevention. The first line, our, our best defense. All of these meds really don't amount to much in comparison to the lifestyle changes that we can make to improve our cognition and our longevity. So it's about choosing the right foods, making sure our blood pressure is stable. Don't smoke, that makes everything worse. Alcohol in very small quantities can be protective. A half a glass of wine, I have no problem with that. When you drink too much, it can actually cause greater problems with not just sleep and mood, but also cognition. Social interaction, stress reduction, and exercise. And just to say a few things, um, there is some really interesting study, uh, uh, research studies looking at all of these different interventions exercise, massage therapy, aromatherapy, weighted blankets, you know, these really heavy blankets that you drape over yourself. They're very soothing. Music therapy, pet therapy, help reduce anxiety and agitation and restlessness in older adults with dementia, especially. So some of those behavioral disturbances can be modified, not with medications, but with these interventions, which are much safer and health promoting. And of course, to make the best uh, comment. It's, it's important to find people that you trust and to hang out with people. Those folks who are socially isolated, who tend to prefer to be alone, are at higher risk for cognitive changes. And so there, again, a lot of recent data suggesting uh, there is safety in numbers. That's why these gatherings are so important. It's better to be around people than alone in a room. Uh, it helps stimulate our brain and, and protect it from uh, the ravages of time. It's uh, about not just stimulation, but using the noodle, right? Use it or lose it. And I can't say enough about exercise. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Walking will help lower your risk. Any kind of exercise will lower the risk of not just dementia, but also heart disease, stroke, et cetera, et cetera. You've heard this before. So in summary, Healthy aging, exercise, good dietary habits may reduce the risk of cognitive decline. And really our job is to catch it early, to identify folks that might need an assessment so that we can find those reversible causes of dementia and make those changes that may help turn things around. Preserving function, improving our sensory function, uh, and of course, preserving cognition at all costs. And I just want to close with this suggestion. This is such a great book. It's been around for decades. They keep doing uh, updates. 
this is called the 36 hour day because if you're a caregiver taking care of somebody with dementia, a 24 hour day feels like a 36 hour day. And this book has some really easy to use tips on how to um, work with somebody who's confused or asks the same questions all day long or is wandering uh, or is getting aggressive, et cetera. They have some really helpful hints and resources here. And if, if reading is not your thing, then go to that Alzheimer's Association Association website. They've got a lot of interesting information there uh, and a lot of great supports locally and across the country. All right, I'm going to close there and open it up for questions. So that, thank you. That was a, an incredibly informative uh, presentation. Uh, so much so that people, I don't have any questions. They're oh my only, gosh. I answered all the questions. questions. But I have a couple of points that have come to my mind, if you don't mind. Please. Um, uh, we talked about, um, you talked about dietary. And I'm wondering how important, because people, older adults, do not like to drink water. Because, of course, then they're always looking for the restroom. Right. So how important, I know when people are dehydrated, it affects it. It can affect them and mimic, actually, um, uh, 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 Alzheimer's or yep. so how important is hydration it's crucial absolutely crucial so dehydration especially in the summertime when we're out and we're losing fluids we don't even realize it is a very common cause of confusion so delirium uh, that confusional state that occurs uh, especially with older adults who don't have the same kind of resilience um, is so common that people who show up in the emergency room confused may often perk up and be sharp right after getting IV fluids. And so I can't emphasize enough how important it is to take in adequate fluids. When they say four to six tall glasses of water every day, they mean four to six glasses or more. And if you have to get up and urinate more, good. That's exercise you need too. Uh, but you just want, you want to cut off the fluids around dinner time so you're not up all night because sleep disruption is another big contributing factor to confusion. So people that are up all night long uh, because of pain or going to the bathroom or they have sleep apnea and they, they're, they're not able to breathe effectively when they fall into deep sleep, there are you know, thousands of cause, causes of sleep disruption. Um, and so that can be a, again, reversible factor if we can help people sleep naturally. Um, so yes, fluids, sleep, diet, exercise. We can help prevent dementia with those interventions. So um, I, John O has is raising his hand. So John, you have a question for Dr. Pinos? I do. Um, actually, I put it in the chat, but I will say here. So I've been diagnosed with chronic microvascular ischemic disease. I'm 75 years old. I had a CAT scan for another reason, and that showed up. Where does that fit in with, okay, how much trouble am I in? Put it there. Okay. Well, first of all, nice to see you again. It's been a long time. Yes, 2009. Nice That's to see you. Wonderful to see you. Thank you, John. I appreciate your jumping in with the question, and a good one at that. So microvascular disease is a problem, but it's also one of those problems that we can modify. So if I did an MRI of any adult age 75 or up, I'm going to find on that MRI scan evidence for microvascular disease. What that means is little teeny tiny strokes in those little teeny tiny blood vessels in the brain. And that happens with aging. You know, the, the, there are little tiny pieces of debris that gets stuck and will block the end of that tiny blood vessel and little, you know, small areas of brain or brain cells will actually die as a result. And they call it white matter disease if, when you look at the scan. Uh, in fact, this, can, this has been correlated with memory loss, cognitive problems, also with depression, loss of energy, motivation, uh, and also executive dysfunction, problems with organizing, sequencing, planning. All of those things can occur with that microvascular disease, depending on where those little teeny tiny strokes occur in the brain. So some people have microvascular disease and they don't even know it and they just carry on with their life. 
Others can't manage their own care or needed supports that they didn't need before. So the way that we help reduce the risk is same old thing, exercise, walking, gets the blood moving. That's what reduces the risk for further strokes or further small vessel disease. Eating a low cholesterol, low fat diet that has protein and healthy uh, uh, carbohydrate, not, not the, not, we don't need uh, the fats from animal meat. We can get our protein in other ways uh, without risking our, our cardiovascular system. Um, avoiding alcohol and smoking, which has been shown to make, you know, smoking makes the blood vessels constrict or get narrower. So naturally that makes that small vessel disease a higher risk. Uh, in the old days, we'd recommend a baby aspirin every day, but that's been shown to increase the risk for bleeds and stomach problems. So we no longer recommend baby aspirin, though some do take baby aspirin under uh, you know, the recommendation of their primary care doctor. So you've got to go back to your primary care doc and say, what can I do to reduce the risk of progressive microvascular disease? Uh, diabetes is a big factor. With diabetes, all of the blood vessels are affected. The whole body, all the major organs. Diabetes is a devastating condition. But if it's well controlled, and again, we're really careful with our diet and we're exercising and trying to sleep right, then we can, again, modify or reduce those risks over time. So it, oh, Alzheimer's disease is progressive. It, it, it just keeps marching down, down, down over time. Microvascular disease, we can hold steady if we're able to, again, get, get control over some of these risk factors. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so uh, one other that is a good segue into, if someone identifies a need, is their primary uh, care provider their um, first point of contact? Yes, number one, primary care. Because they, they'll do the general review of the blood pressure, the, the tests, the physical exam, they're the ones who are going to look at the medication list. What can we reduce or maybe change to reduce the risk for these terrible side effects? Uh, and if they see the need, they'll refer it to a specialist like myself or somebody in neurology, for instance, who could do more thorough cognitive testing and maybe even think about these medications that are available to help improve our cognition. So first start with the primary care doc. That's primary right. care. I have a, one other question. You know, the recommendation is that uh, you read it, you know, these things come over the internet and whatever, email. They're recommending eight hours of sleep a night. Well, personally, I do not sleep eight hours. Who I does. <laughs> right. So, you know, my body only sleeps like six hours. That's, is that, that's normal. That's good. Yeah, that's good. It's no my problem. body. Everybody's different. I, I've met people that their normal rhythm is they only sleep three or four hours. That's all they get. They're not tired and they function just fine. Others need 10 or 12. Everybody's different. Everybody's uh, and so I, I don't try to change what's natural. But if, you're, if your usual sleep pattern is six hours every night and suddenly you're only sleeping three or four hours, we've got to find out why and make some corrections. And I would really encourage people to avoid sleeping medicines. All of those sleeping medicines like Ativan, Clonopin, Valium, all, all of those medicines that are anti-anxiety medicines actually disrupt sleep. They help you fall asleep, but then they actually will suppress dream sleep or that deep slow wave restorative sleep that we get to dream sleep is suppressed by these medications. So you wake up feeling more tired and they actually will impair cognition. So people that take these benzodiazepines over time We'll have memory loss, confusion, increased risk for falls. It's better to stick with melatonin or natural sleep remedies and to avoid all that over-the-counter stuff and to avoid these sleeping medicines. I'm happy to hear that you, you've got a lot of the natural um, supplements here. Absolutely. So, Well, th thank you so much, um, Dr. Pinels. You, you are a wealth of information as always. I and I, I hope it informs people as well as dispels some of the things that they hear and read like the eight hour you know sleep a, a night so thank you so much My and uh, thank you so i just wanted to let everybody else know that uh typically we have been doing this once a month on the first wednesday and um i have made the decision to uh, retire from CHA. So the lunch and learn is going to go on hiatus until uh, until further notice. Oh. So um, 
But anyway, um, thank you all for joining us. And this, as always, will be on the older adult page. For, anyone can go back. If you forget anything, you can go back and review it. <laughs> thank Roberta, you so much. We're gonna miss you so much. I wish you the best. I wish you well in your next pursuit. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you all.